Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy Friday. Hope you're having a nice day so far. I am Mark Medeiros, Community Engagement Manager for Peninsula Open Space Trust. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the Native peoples whose territories we are joining from. I'm here in the South Bay. And for that reason, I'd like to acknowledge the Moekma Ohlone tribe and the Amamutsun tribal band, whose territories are where I am now and closest to me. So wherever you are, please pause to acknowledge the native people whose land you are on and go beyond that to uh, commit to learning about their histories, current struggles, and ways that you could get involved to directly support their goals moving forward. Uh, so for those of you who are new to our post programming um, or who haven't heard about post before, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 1977. And throughout our history, we've been working in San Mateo, Santa Clara and Northern Santa Cruz counties to protect land for the benefit of all people in our region. And we've protected almost 80,000 acres of land so far most of which is now part of our public parks network, including Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, our county parks, state parks, uh, the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge, et cetera. So um, a lot of great work over the years and it's all thanks to our generous donors, uh, many of whom are watching today. I wanna say thank you, we love you. Um, we appreciate you so much for uh, the support over the years and for making this work possible. So today we're uh, dealing with a challenging topic, which is the history of racism and exclusion in American conservation movements. You know, um, it's difficult to, to uh, engage with this history because many of us love our national parks, some of these leaders that we idolize. And it's a mixed bag. Um, but the good news is that many organizations are making great progress to take this context into their framework and um, build a more progressive and inclusive future for conservation in our country. And so to help us with this con conversation today, we'll be joined by members of the Avarna Group. The Avarna Group is a consulting firm that creates pathways, provides resources, and create strategies that support the outdoor and environmental sector in their evolution towards justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, collectively known as JEDI. Um, today, we're joined by Eva Holiday, Aparna Rajagopal, and Jose Gonzalez, uh, three great people who we've had the privilege to work with at POST, um, who have worked with many of our partners and are gonna walk us through this discussion. So. With that, I'd like to welcome you all to the program. Hey. Hi. Hi, Mark. Hey. Hi, everyone. Um, just really quick, I'm Aparna. I use she, hers pronouns. I'm actually um, calling in today from Chochenyo Ohlone land in the East Bay. Uh, and I'm one of the founding partners of the Avarna Group. Um, and um, I will leave my intro at that. I'm really just excited to be here and I'm gonna hand it off to Jose. Hello, everybody. Buenos dias. My name is Jose Gonzalez. Uh, he, him, his. I am reaching you all today from ancestral, uh, traditional, and stolen lands of the Maidu and Miwok in Northern California. So currently, Sacramento, California. And the only thing I'll add is I'm excited to be here. I'm an educator with background in training and uh, historian by interest and, and, and uh, focus. So with that, uh, I'll pass it over to Ava. Hi everyone, I'm Ava, I use she, hers pronouns, and I'm calling you from ancestral Bitterroot Salish land, which is also in Missoula, Montana. Um, excited to be here. I wanted to share with you all just a quick a little framing and then I'll hand it off to Aparna, so we'll get started. Today we're mostly gonna be doing content delivery. We just have an hour, we actually now just have 55 minutes. We wanna guide you all through a learning process to more deeply understand how the conservation movement has been imbued in systemic oppression, a tough topic as Mark said. This webinar represents years of learning and listening uh, throughout the entire Avarna group to understand how oppression and conservation are intertwined. And yet we wanna be clear that we're always learning as well. So this webinar will not provide a complete picture. That's a lifelong journey and project that we're all committed to and you're just catching us in the middle of it. So with that, I'll hand it off to Aparna who will get us going. 
Yeah, so I want to get us started just talking about feelings before we start with the content. I bet you didn't realize we we're going to talk about feelings today, but feelings are going to come up for, for all of us. Um, this content, this history, a lot of which we haven't grown up learning, can have deep impacts on people. And so for those of you perhaps who's, um, whose lived experience has been deeply and negatively impacted by systemic oppression, I imagine what we're going to present may be a painful rehashing of, of history, of your own ancestral history, perhaps. And so we hope that you do what you need to do to take care of yourself. For those of you who are surprised by this information or newer to this information, um, you might feel sad or guilty about not knowing some of this. Um, Brene Brown talks about guilt as the disconnection between your values and your actions. And sometimes when we learn new information, um, we have that, that disconnect happens when we realize that maybe our actions aren't aligned uh, with our the values that we originally thought we had. And, and so to move through our guilt, um, we encourage all of you, and we're in this journey with you, to think about this as an opportunity and a responsibility to ask critical questions about how you can move through that feeling. Um, for people who have backgrounds where you have, you know, for me, my background, I often think about this and I talk to Jose about this. We both have both colonizer and colonized, oppressor and oppress, oppressed in our backgrounds. And this material brings up a lot of really complex feelings. Um, and so I ask you all to just sit with it. Um, those complex feelings are okay. You know, really whatever the impact of it is on you today, um, we, we just ask you to do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, to ensure that we all can continue to come back to the material, which is the most important part. Finally, I just wanna leave you with something uh, a Mohawk colleague, uh, Karen Caputer once um, shared with Ava, which is that the history, a lot of the history that we're sharing today has been buried for a reason. Um, at best, it's just tough to reconcile and grapple with. It's counter to the history taught um, you know, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and I didn't learn about a lot of this history that is very specific to where I was raised, where, right here um, in Berkeley and Oakland in the East Bay. And digging into this history raises really big, complex philosophical questions about how to grapple with it. And so if you're feeling shame um, about not knowing about some of this stuff, know that it's not readily available information. And, you know, really at the Varner Group, it's part of our job to unearth a lot of it. And while it's not your responsibility for have not having been taught this, we hope you'll share this responsibility with us to help seeking out these stories, to, to keep seeking out these stories and keep unearthing them and keep sharing them. So with that said, I'm gonna hand it off to Jose to start us with the content and also going to screen share. Very well, thank you so much, Aparna. Well, we are actually going to start off with a really kind of quick short story that I want you to just, if you're out there in the audience or if you're tuning in and watching this afterwards, just to picture this in your head, just visualize it um, and think about this, uh, what comes up in sharing uh, this narrative and this story. The plaintiffs were nervous. By 1969, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, has certainly made the impact of using the pesticide DDT to spray crops more visible in the public eye. But it provided them little to no support or encouragement because their arguments against the use of DDT hadn't been tested in a court of law. They were challenging a power structure deriving economic benefits from DDT. But ultimately, their lawsuit became the basis of the successful petition to force the EPA to ban DDT, a victory of recognized importance in the environmental movement. Now, often in workshop mode, we've asked people to kind of type in the chat box or to comment, um, what, what do you picture as the plaintiffs in this, in this case? Who do you picture as the plaintiffs in this case? What do they look like? What is, what is their lived experience? What is their background? Um, you're invited to, of course, if you're live with us now, to do that as well. And often uh, a common response is environmentalist, or even more specifically, uh, around a gender, race, and ethnicity to say white environmentalists and different variations of that. And in a way that's quote unquote normal because that's part of the narrative that we've had. So in picturing plaintiffs as quote unquote pretty standard environmental groups fighting to protect endangered wildlife from harmful and toxic uh, chemicals, kind of a Rachel quote unquote, Rachel Carson types, um, we might also know a little bit more detail. Uh, so for example, that Environmental Defense Fund was involved um, and this was very impactful um, uh, in their role as an environmental organization. 
However, not many people might picture, for example, the United Farm Workers Movement or just the farm worker movement in general as the plaintiffs, let alone California Rural Legal Assistance, CRLA, fighting to protect farm workers who were constantly sprayed by pesticides. And even if you did picture CRLA and the UFW, many of us often might picture Cesar Chavez and perhaps not Rafael Vascal, the lawyer, the Chicano lawyer who led the legal fight. We also may not as readily picture Dolores Huerta, a true leader of the movement against DDT, who continues to advocate for conservation issues to this day. You also do not hear, uh, know or hear about the plaintiffs in uh, Ralph Savascal's case, six migrant farm workers uh, that included nursing mothers. Now, the farm worker experience perspective differed from Carson's and EDF's in that it saw environmentalism and working rights as inseparable. To them, the health of farm workers was by definition an environmental issue. EDF was trying to make their case based on impacts on wildlife, but it was the human impact that gave the case traction, and DDT was ultimately discontinued in 1972 thanks to the effort of CRLA, UFW, and the Lotus Huertas efforts in California. So going back to what you might have pictured in your heads, if you didn't picture the Lotus Huerta, if you didn't picture women farm workers, again, that doesn't uh, mean that you're a bad person. Your image uh, most often might have come from your own experiences, stories you have been told, and the media you passively or actively uh, consumed. What stories did you read, and even what the education system might have highlighted. So those experiences and stories shape our biases and help us fill in the gaps of knowledge when we don't have a lot of information to go off on. And most of us haven't learned about Dolores Huerta or the UFW, let alone CRLA. So what's the issue with this? Well, what we picture in our heads for these scenarios can seem innocuous, but there are two key issues and one key lesson to learn about filling in the gaps with the usual suspects. First issue. If you only see people with dominant identities, then you may be less likely to trust people with marginalized identities in those roles. This can lead to hiring bias, performance evaluation bias, and Black Indigenous people of color, BIPOC staff being less valued, and more. Now, second issue is that people with marginalized identities may not see themselves in the conservation movement, though they may be drawn to the field, not having role models who have a similar identity or background can deter, deter young people from pursuing a career in conservation. And the lesson is that it's important for us to investigate why we collectively only can see people with dominant identities. This is not just a coincidence that we imagine similar images, and it's not a coincidence that conservation work is predominantly white. In fact, we know that this unconscious wiring actually creates stereotypes around how much we think particular communities care about the environment stereotypes that have been debunked by a lot of research and especially a lot of new survey and a lot of new data. Now this chart here uh, on levels of environmental concern shows public perception versus actual concern for the environment among different groups. The red bars show the public perception which represents the stereotypes we may have about communities and the green bars represent the community's actual self-perception. What this chart shows is public perception versus reality are way off for marginalized communities who actually are much more concerned about the environment than the public perceives them to be, and who also happen to report the highest level of concern when compared to dominant groups. More recent data shows that Black and Latinx populations are more concerned about climate change uh, than the white community at large, for example. And the same data said they found that Black and Latinx communities are more willing to join a campaign to fight, to fight climate change than white folks. This is also true in terms of support of a, a broad array of conservation policies, including being able to increase uh, taxing and funding. So how do we get to a point when we have stereotypes that Black, Indigenous, people of color don't care about the environment? that stories of our environmentalists and conservationists are only about white people and maybe even specifically white men, or that organizations like EDF uh, likely will get, receive and will receive more funding for organizations like the UFW and CRLA will not. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about this and the talk is designed to help us better understand how we got to, to this place in conservation um, and conservation funding that is overwhelmingly white, Western, and male-dominated. And to kick us off on uh, this process, I'm gonna turn it over to Aparna. Uh, 
Thank you, Jose. So to understand why conservation is predominantly white and male, why we create these pictures in our heads, right, that don't represent reality, it's really helpful to dig into the history. And to do that, I'm, you know, we're going to want to ask four key questions. So here are the four questions. There's the why question. So why was conservation as a field emerging? And we're really going to look at the mid to late 1800s when the movement really was taking shape. Why did it become important? What were some of the driving ideologies and values of those who are at the helm? And, and what was their relationship to people and place and wildlife? There's also the who, so this is related, but who were the folks at the helm? Who shaped the conservation movement, the contours of it? Who had the social or cultural capital at the time? Meaning who had the social power to influence and drive decisions both within the US and more specifically within the conservation movement? Then there's the for whom. So for whom and for what were conservation practices carried out? Whose ideas, whose connections to place, whose well-being were centered and whose were ignored, sacrificed, or sought to be extinguished in that process? And then the how is the final thing, which is how was conservation carried out? Um, what was the process? Like what were the actual practices and processes used by conservationists, whether they were nonprofits or individuals or government entities um, to set aside land for concert or, or water or wildlife for conservation purposes? So these four questions are really meant to give you some framing. And before we go into the details of the history that'll help answer some of these questions, I do want to talk about the answer to the first one, the why, um, to understand the who and the the for, for whom and how we do need to go through that history. But there are a few philosophies that really are a through line. They really underpin and continue to fuel the entire conservation movement. And you'll notice these philosophies cropping up, these ideologies cropping up over and over throughout history that, um, and Ava's gonna talk about the history in a little bit, but through that history in legislation and policy and court decisions and cultural movements. And so the first ideology I wanna talk about to answer the why question is, um, is is this one right here, the doctrine of discovery, which was really um, laid out in what's called the inter, I don't know if I'm saying this right, inter satera, inter catera papal bull. And this was way back in 1493. We're going pretty far back. But this is the doctrine that really stated that Western European Christians had the divine right to control land and resources and the people on the land to carry out God's will. So this decree really justified both the colonization of the Americas as well as the enslavement of Africans and really the colonization of a lot of the world. This particular doctrine was actually, you know, later showed up and manifested in Manifest Destiny. And I think, you know, a lot of us learn about this in school of the 1800s. Manifest Destiny became a driving ideology behind westward expansion. And it mandated that white settlers had a duty to settle the West, which was translated to controlling, again, not only the wild landscapes, but also controlling the indigenous populations by any means necessary. Um, this painting here uh, is by John Gass, and it's a pretty infamous de depiction of Manifest Destiny, and it's worth taking a closer look. Uh, and by the way, we'll send you a, a, a link to the slide deck um, so you can spend all that free time looking at it. So that's the first set of ideologies, really, you know, the doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny. The second set of ideologies is more related to racial distinctions. And I imagine some of your hackles may go up and may get a little uncomfortable seeing white supremacy up here, but it does show up and you'll see it show up throughout history. And white supremacy is the idea or the ideology that white people and their ideas and thoughts and beliefs and actions are superior to people of color and their ideas and thoughts and beliefs and actions. And you, all, you might also hear uh, the, the concept of white supremacy culture, which is an artificial historically constructed culture which expresses, justifies, and binds together the United States white supremacy system. So it's really the glue that binds together uh, a lot of the institutions that were in power. And though we, I'm assuming all of us on this, on this particular presentation don't believe in this ideology, that ideology continued to fuel, that fueled the beginning of the conservation movement in many ways and, and really allowed settlers to go through the mental gymnastics necessary to justify the exploitation of labor, the extraction of natural resources and the disposal of people and communities who got in the way. It also reinforced manifest destiny as well as the justified the genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement of Africans and the desire to purify the genetic pool in the US, which is known as eugenics, a concept that Ava is going to touch on a little bit in the history. 
So this is the second set of ideologies. Now the last set of ideologies that helps answer the why question is probably a little more recognizable to you all. And this is the idea of transcendentalism. We have the date here of when Walden what, by Henry David Thoreau was uh, published, but Walden and Ralph Waldo, I mean, sorry, uh, Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson and others that were part of that transcendental movement were pivotal in changing American attitudes about wilderness from something you know scary that had to be tamed into a bucolic or working landscape to a place that you go to to become closer to God, to challenge yourself, a place of awe. You know, this really mapped on well to the idea that Americans were rugged individuals, very different and distinct from Europeans, and, and it formed the basis of our distinct national identity. Another point about transcendentalism that's interesting to us, it really shifted the way that settlers thought about land, water, and wildlife. And that language still pervades the language we use today in conservation. So if we think about how many times we've heard people talk about, you know, the, the mountains are my church, or um, I go here to challenge myself. These are all relics of, of the transcendental movement. And the final thing I'll say about transcendentalism is what we've noticed is that the narrative around the transcendental movement, though we often use this, that language of like the mountains are my church, it really obscures and erases the colonial history of how settlers came to have a relationship with the land. So we went from you know doctrine of discovery, this is ours to manifest destiny. We have, we have a divine responsibility to settle the land to transcendentalism, which is, you know, we should revere and protect these places within a Judeo-Christian context. So this, sort of answers the why question. And again, as Ava goes through the history in a second, I want you all to think about these three ideologies and how they crop up throughout the the, uh, the historical facts that Ava presents. So actually with that said, I'm gonna actually hand it off to Ava to walk us through some history. All right. So for the next 15, 20 minutes, I'm gonna walk through some history that will hopefully more fully answer the questions that Aparna posed to you all. And then we'll end today with some examples of um, sort of the, the impact of all of this history today that we're seeing today, as well as how conservation can be used for a tool for justice. So we will end on a hopeful note. I wanna make a disclaimer on this timeline that it is by no means holistic. I'm guessing we'll leave out some history that is near and dear maybe to your family history or to your work or whatever connections you have. And we encourage you all to bring all of that information, this and more back to your teams, uh, back to your community and continue to talk through this important history. We selected the particular moments in history in this timeline because some of it helps contextualize more broadly what was going, in the U going on in the US at the time. So sort of um, understanding what was happening in environmental history as well as the rest of the US. Um, that's sort of a false distinction. Some of them are about the formulation of both public and private land ownership. And some of them are about specific pieces of conservation uh, history that we often hear as more of like the quote unquote commonly known history. Just again, to give you some context so we can sort of root of like, okay, this is when the Forest Service was established and we can sort of think through all the, those pieces of what else is going on. So together, this timeline is meant to support you all in continuing to connect the dots between environmental history, social justice history, and just broadly US history. Often we hear about these histories in a silo and that prevents us from being able to really contextualize all of this. And then the last thing that I'll say is before I get into this timeline is that uh, I just wanna reiterate that it can hit folks pretty hard and in different ways. So just a reminder to take care of yourself. I'll try and remind you to take deep breaths. I often have to take a deep breath because this is hard. So we wanna start off way back in the 1400s and uh, all the way up to the 1600s. And there was a recent study at the University College in London that found that the genocide and the killing of 56 million indigenous people by European colonizers and now what is now the North and South America, what we call now North and South America, actually caused a little ice age um, that impacted our entire planet. So this picture here is of people skating over an, a river in England that was freezing regularly during that time period. And we share this to say that colonialism has been impacting and continues to impact our climate, um, sort of just as a start. I next wanna just note that in 1619, the enslavement of Africans begin in the US. And this is a practice that, as we all know, will not be outlawed for another 250 years. So from 1619, another 250 years. And those ramifications are still being felt today by black communities across the US. And as many of you know, the impacts are of slavery are well documented in the 1619 project and encourage you all to check that out. In 1763, 
the proclamation line becomes one of the earliest policy decisions, and this was um, made by the British colonial government, uh, that legitimizes the removal of indigenous people from their ancestral lands and specifically removal uh, from east of the Appalachian Divide to the west. In 1812, the General Land Office is established to formalize the distinction between public and private lands and start to implement um, some of the nation's first significant land ownership and disposal laws, and that includes the Homestead Act and the Preemption Act. So by this time, settlers view themselves as the rightful owners of the land and then take to divvying, divvying up the land to individuals for private use and reserve some for public use for the benefit of building a new nation, but really think about whose benefit it was. I wanna talk about a time period between the 1820s and the 1840s, 50s. Um, in this picture here, this GIF here sort of depicts the um, rapid dispossession of indigenous land. So if you're curious what this is about, that's what that is about. I wanna get into some details here. So over the course of a couple of decades through courts and Congress, in addition to military and vigilante actions, indigenous people are killed, removed, um, and dispossessed of their ancestral lands. And then they're subjected to countless indignities, often in service of public lands or privatizing lands. So a couple of examples. In 1823, there was a court case, Johnson versus McIntosh, that holds that indigenous people are not allowed to legally own land, despite their presence and their stewardship and their caring for those spaces. And then in 1830, the Indian Removal Act is signed by Andrew Jackson, Jackson, and that calls for the removal of Native Americans from their lands in the Southeast in exchange for lands in west of the Mississippi. And that results in the Trail of Tears that I'm sure you all have heard of. So just in a very short time period, through congressional action and through judicial action, indigenous people are dispossessed of so many uh, lands and rights. Moving further west, in 1848, at the end of the Mexican-American War, the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo gives the U.S. ownership of California and much of what is known today of like New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, parts of Wyoming, Colorado, huge portion of land, as you all can see on this map here. And though most Mexicans owning land in these areas accept the U.S. offer to become an American citizen and retain ownership of their lands, their property rights, property rights were later eliminated in part to establish public lands like the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. In the 1850s, I wanna talk a little bit more specifically about what's going on in California. Um, so once Mexican land is opened up for continued removal of indigenous communities, settlers leapfrog over uh, much of former Mexican territory to settle in California during the gold rush and further dispossess indigenous people of their lands and their rights. So by the time the U.S. annexes California, its indigenous people have either been killed or part of an assimilation campaign launched by Spanish missions. And the dispossession of indigenous people from their lands and from their rights is continued to be formalized in California when they pass the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians in the 1850s. So this legalizes indentured servitude of indigenous people for both adults and children, as well as forcible removal. And this is often sometimes called uh, California's quiet genocide. In 1851, more specifically, in what is now called Yosemite Valley, Mariposa Battalion, a California state militia unit, killed and burned the homes of Awanichi people. And this picture here um, on the left is of Awanichi women. Uh, they were only allowed to stay in the valley if they were to perform basket weaving um, and sort of become a living museum. And then finally, I wanna share with you all in 1852, um, there were some treaties that were uh, that were written in California that were related to 18 different tribes in California. It was sent to the U.S. Senate, so the U.S. Senate, not California Senate, the U.S. Senate, uh, to be ratified, but it, they were never ratified, um, which helps explain why there are so few federally recognized tribes today in California. Um, and the tribes were not notified that it was not ratified until 1905, so however many years later that is. So this is within three years and just within one geography, within one state, you can see sort of the intensity of uh, the dehumanization of indigenous people, often in service of what are now public lands. We wanna move forward to 1865. So with the end of the Civil War and the abolition of slavery begins the Jim Crow era, um, which 
when we're talking about Jim Crow era or laws, these are laws that are enacted in cities and states um, across the South and across the US that legalizes racial segregation and discrimination. And this segregation is later formalized in the 1896 decision Plessy versus Ferguson. That's where we get that separate but equal doctrine. And this means that although, although slavery has been abolished, formerly enslaved people continue to fight for basic rights. And parks at the time, uh, like Shenandoah National Park, portrayed here, are segregated. In addition, Black people are increasingly terrorized by the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. And I want to just note here to give you all some sort of conservation grounding or history is that a year before the end of the Civil War, uh, we also passed the Yosemite Land Grant Act, which designates parts of Yosemite as the first federally protected land for public enjoyment. But we really can think about public, who is part of that public and whose enjoyment is really considered in that process. In 1872, during the height of the Jim Crow era, the Yellowstone National Park was established as the first national park. So providing this for you all to just think about, okay, this is our first national park, what's happened pr prior to that? I want to move forward to sort of the 1880s to the 18, 1920s and talk about immigration a bit. Um, so I want to start with the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Um, that started uh, this sort of slew of legislation and numerous laws that were passed to prohibit immigration from China and other East Asian and South uh, Asian countries, denying uh, citizenship to Asians living in the U.S. and to prevent men of Asian descent from marrying white women. I want to note that these are the same people who worked at an incredibly grueling pace to build the railroads, which made our public lands accessible. And that's what this bottom picture is here. Some of the Chinese railroad workers that really opened up the West for folks to be able to access those public lands. The next one to move on to talk about the Forest Reserve Act of 1891. As, an, as indigenous people are being removed from large swaths of land to create a side, uh, side spaces for public enjoyment in the East, that was primarily, a lot of that was happening in the West. It was happening all over, but we focused a little bit more on the West just in those last couple of acts. But I do wanna pull us back East and talk about the Forest Reserve Act in 1891, strict rural people uh, living subsistence livelihoods in the Adirondacks and in other places of their ability to hunt, fish, and gather food and other goods. And this really impacted their way of life and their livelihood. This was impacted rural white folks as well as indigenous people. Moving on to 1906, take a big deep breath, by the way, if you need to. This is tough stuff to hear about. Um, the, I want to talk about the Antiquities Act. So at one year after the Forest Services is, is established, they're established in 1905, the Antiquities Act is signed into law and Devil's Tower, which is also known as Mato Tepila, becomes the first national monument. And this place is interesting for all sorts of reasons, but I wanted to talk uh, about some recent disputes over climbing and Devil's Tower as a case study for conservation being used as a force to continue that, that colonial oppression. So Mato Tepila becomes public land only after the legal dispossession of this land from indigenous people. So that happened in the 1800s. These same tribes today, and especially in the, in the 90s, continue to be able to, uh, are they're unable to prevent climbing from happening on a place that is sacred to them and have only been able to succeed in the issuance of a voluntary climbing ban when they need to observe ceremony in June. And ironically, conservation groups have succeeded in imposing a mandatory climbing ban during falcon nesting season. So it's a good example of what values we have behind and who we are conserving and what we are conserving and what's pushing all of that, um, all of that movement. So just something to think about. I wanna move on to 1916, and you probably thought I was gonna talk about the establishment of the National Park Service, but first and foremost, I wanna talk about Madison Grant publishing the Passing of the Great Race. So this is a book that is, um, is a eugenics book uh, and it is praised by leaders such as Hitler. So take that in for a moment. Grant worked side by side with figures such as Teddy Roosevelt to found the Bronx Zoo and to preserve California's redwoods and to protect American bison. And many of Grant's eugenics-based ideas of purity still manifest in conservation philosophies that stereotype people of color and immigrants as not caring about the environment, 
um, as Jose was talking about earlier today, and the alleged purity of landscapes like the redwoods, for example, that should be unblemished by humans, particularly Black, Indigenous people of color and immigrants. So this is all coming, This, what I'm saying here is that Madison Grant's eugenics philosophies really bleed into his conservation philosophies as well. And I wanna just note today, because this has been hitting me particularly hard, is that eugenics is still happening today. This week's report about ICE performing hysterectomies without consent is a clear example of how eugenics continues to, to be present today. So all of this is happening the same year that NPS, the National Park Service, is established. I next wanna talk about the 19th Amendment, which is passed and it allows women to vote, but I should note that it's predominantly white women. Black women, indigenous women, and women of color uh, don't get their right to vote uh, for many years later. And in fact, many women of color are still fighting for the right to vote today. Want to move, skip ahead to the New Deal. Um, we're sort of skipping and jumping ahead in history here, but I want to talk about the New Deal for two reasons. Um, so the New Deal creates a whole bunch of new programs and policies around housing, agriculture, jobs, um, and that was really great for some folks, but it wasn't particularly great, especially for folks of color. So the first example that I wanna share with you all is that in the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, black and indigenous people are generally not permitted to participate in this program. In states where they are allowed to participate, their enrollment was usually capped around 10%. And then when they were allowed to participate, black men in particular experienced severe racism. The other piece of the New Deal that I wanna talk about is the FHA um, and the creation of the FHA also means the creation of some redlining in urban areas. So um, this includes allowing deeds that are still on record today, explicitly disallowing black and Jewish people from owning particular property in particular neighborhoods. Um, and this racial segregation supported by redlining has had impacts on the health of black and brown families who today live in areas that are most impacted by climate and environmental degradation. So think flood zones, landfills, industrial pollution. And I also just wanted to share that a recent study in, um, shows that the impacts of redlining today contributed to the lack of thriving wildlife biodiversity in certain neighborhoods. So this is all to say that racism and redlining hurts not only humans, but it also hurts wildlife. Just a couple more portions of history. I wanna talk about World War II. Um, and there are a lot of pieces of World War II that we could talk about, but I wanna talk about the impacts on Japanese Americans, on folks who were enrolled in the Bracero program and on black veterans. So during World War II, census, using census data, the US government tracked down and placed uh, 117,000 Japanese Americans into internment camps and stripping them of their rights as citizens. Also during World War II, the US recruits Mexican workers in the US to work in agriculture and they provide really poor wages and poor working conditions. And after World War II is over providing almost no viable pathway to citizenship. So similar to the Chinese railroad workers, these folks worked so hard to keep folks fed during World War II and then were uh, given no uh, rights and were actually sort of encouraged to leave the country and then finally, I want to talk about the GI Bill that came after World War II. This was generally really supportive of white veterans, allowing them to attend college free of loans and obtain home loans. But those same rights weren't afforded to African Americans. There wasn't any explicit language in the GI Bill, but there were a whole bunch of um, tricks, including um, outright bullying and dishonorable discharge for black veterans, which rendered them ineligible to receive those rights. I want to just give you all one more sort of conservation uh, anchor here, which is in the 1946 and 1949, we had the establishment of the BLM and the establishment of the Fish and Wildlife Services, respectively. So just sort of thinking through what else is happening in the U.S. while these huge agencies are created. And then I wanna end our timeline today in just talking about a couple of notable moments in the 60s and 70s. First, in 1964, the Wilderness Act is signed and the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, is authorized. Um, and the Wilderness Act defines the wilderness as parts, uh, as a place that's untrammeled by man, which really erases all of the indigenous presence um, that is and continues to be in these uh, public lands. In that same year, the Civil Rights Act is signed, as well as the Voting Rights Act. Um, 
And this is one of the first times in which folks of color are able to lean on some legislation where they can uh, assert their rights. And then finally, in 1978, the American Indian uh, Religious Freedom Act is passed. And this is to protect the rights of Native Americans to exercise traditional religions by ensuring access to sites, use, possession of sacred objects, and freedom to worship through ceremonials and traditional rites. This picture here is of indigenous women hike um, and Jolie Varela, Varela and uh, a couple of other indigenous or native women who engaged in a hike on the Nuumo Poyo, which we might know better as the John Muir Trail. And they actually did not obtain permits and they hiked under this particular piece of legislation, reclaiming their right to be in these spaces. Um, so I'm going to stop the timeline here, not because things magically got better, but really wanted to just show you some of how the, the sort of uh, what was going on in the US while conservation continued to build and move and grow to give you all some context to really understand how conservation and social justice history are actually quite entwined and we should be talking about them together to be able to better move forward. With that said, I'm gonna hand it off to Aparna who's gonna go through the impacts. So for some of you, you may be thinking, okay, this is this is great, interesting history. It's all in the past, we've moved beyond this uh, type of you know land grabbing and there are a whole bunch of laws now that protect civil rights. And in some ways, you know, you're right, our laws have shifted, but we know that oppression still exists. And we also know that the conservation movement was born out of the history that Ava just mentioned. And so it's not benevolent or even neutral, right? It's a product of those ideologies that I talked about earlier, uh, the doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny and white supremacy and transcendentalism. And this is a history that we need to know in order to push back on systemic oppression that still impacts people today, because we know we're in the we're in the throes of it. Oppression still exists, and conservation as a movement is not absolved from or devoid of the social and political dynamics. So, I I imagine that might feel overwhelming. Um, but and undoing you know years of oppression takes a lot of work. We can't just passively say though that we disagree with racism or disagree with white supremacy, um, and then continue on you know with business as usual. Because if we do as a movement. We risk being complicit in existing systems that from the beginning were designed uh, without black and indigenous and people of color in mind, and actually in some ways designed explicitly uh, with, the, with the intent of oppressing black and indigenous and people of color. Finally, it's important to note that you know, white settlers shaped the conservation movement, and that includes the dispossession of land, what, you know, answering those questions like what public lands were for, how they should be managed. And those decisions were all in the eyes of those who came to settle the West. And the impacts of this are not just that conservation was you know, created through a white gaze, but also that it deeply limits our ability to think beyond the structures that we've set up today. So some of us working in conservation organizations, um, the, for us, the hardest work we have is to reimagine what this movement can look like because this is all we know. So before I hand it off to Jose to close us out, I do want to talk about what are some of the impacts of this history? So how can you connect the dots between what Ava just presented and your work in the conservation sector? And I'll just give you some examples. And generally, um, the impacts fall under two different categories. So the history has really shaped two aspects of, of our work in conservation. It's shaped our, our perceptions around human relationships to land. And when I say land, I, I include land and water and wildlife, and then also our relationships to each other. So some of the ways in which our relationships to land, like this history has shaped our relationships to land is the fact that there's even land ownership, that there's a possessive narrative around land and wildlife, that really comes from colonialism and a settler perspective, right? That we own this place. Also that we valuate land in certain ways. There, there are land val and valuation systems that we use. There are, I know some organizations use what's called the conservation matrix to assess the, the natural resources value of a particular piece of land. Again, that valuation comes from colonialism. This is a really big one. The fact that we view in the conservation movement oftentimes as humans being separate from nature, 
and in opposition to nature or bad for nature. Uh, you may have even heard of the tragedy of the commons, this idea that we're not even able to, to manage or, or be able to sustain uh, the nature on which we rely as a, as a public resource. Um, that all, again, it comes from, from this history and specifically from this idea of transcendentalism. There's also this attachment in the conservation and you know conservation and recreation space of like what is the right way to connect to land? What's the right way to care for land? What does recreation mean? And thinking about that in a pretty myopic way. And then um, our relationships to each other have also been shaped by this history. There has been a massive erasure of indigenous ways of knowing that includes even place names, right? The names of places that are, are usually settler names on maps and they're GIS maps. Uh, our knowledge of land and water and wildlife often comes from Western science, not from traditional ecological knowledge. Um, there's also a disregard of tribal sovereignty. Uh, and there's also, you know, a disregard of treaties. Uh, Ava mentioned the history. And there's also just a lack of, of authentic and deep engagement with tribal and indigenous communities. Another way you'll see this history pan out is that social and environmental justice work, food justice, health justice, all that justice work has been completely siloed from what we think of as this, the, the conventional or standard environmental movement. There's also an anti-immigration sentiment and stereotypes as, as uh, Jose talked about, about who actually cares about conservation, who cares about the environment, who cares about climate change. There's a continued lack of safety and inclusive experiences in public spaces that are set up uh, with con by conservation groups. Black and indigenous and people of color often share these stories. And then there's the idea of green gentrification. And this really uh, co comes up when green spaces are created with very positive intent by conservation groups. But those green spaces are created in neighborhoods generally that are wealthy. And then when there are created in neighborhoods that aren't, it drives up the desirability of the area and then displaces the existing community. So these are just some examples. And if we had a chance to work with you over a period of a year, we could talk about all the ways it shows up in your organization. But I'm going to stop talking about impacts and uh, want to go from the so what to the now what and hand it off to Jose. Thank you, Aparna. All right, so as Aparna mentioned, moving on from the so what to the now what. So what may be some actions uh, and coupled with the awareness, uh, some doing along with the knowing. So one of the first things you can start off is by resourcing those most impacted. Look at the way you can invest in the communities who have been most negatively impacted by, the, by this history, especially black, indigenous, and brown communities. They have not been under-resourced um, just by happenstance. Second is reimagine conservation. Reimagine a new version of conservation that is explicitly anti-racist because the conservation movement we have is likely the only conservation movement we've known, as Aparna noted. And conservation can be used as a force for good, uh, as many as uh, also you know. So for example, there are organizations engaging in returning land to indigenous communities through repatriation or rematriation, um, according to uh, women-led land trust right here in the Bay Area. The establishment of cultural easements, the use of cur current laws like the Antiquities Act and cultural heritage laws to establish new land designations, co-management, recognition, recognition of broken treaty rights related to hunting, fishing, uh, and then of course, the, this is very timely, indigenous burning of uh, practices uh, that benefits the ecosystem. And then of course, advocating for tribal sovereignty. There are also organizations supporting reparations work by returning resources to black and brown farmers and the return of stolen land to the descendants of enslaved people um, who had that land ownership as well. Three is revisit stories about significant conservation contributions by black, indigenous, and people of color communities. Now, at our group here is part of our work is to seek out new stories and we're constantly learning about new to us stories um, in people and community. And unlike the life of John Muir, for example, it can be hard to easily access these stories. Nevertheless, we continue to deepen our own learning as we continue to unvary on, uh, our untold stories and examine the bias behind them. Four is revere community knowledge, especially knowledge from black and indigenous and uh, people of color communities. Uh, it's, for example, uh, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, 
The dehumanization of black and indigenous people specifically also means discounting their knowledge. One story that has resonated a lot um, is, for example, Kivalina, which is a small coastal village up in Northwest Alaska, which is a frontline community when it comes to climate change. And in the last 20 years, Kivalina has gotten more attention as a frontline community, but they have been noting rising sea levels since at least the 1950s. And yet no Western scientists took their concerns seriously until recently when sea level rise became a topic of concern on a more global level. And then lastly, reflect on and address hallmarks of white supremacy culture and organization. This includes everything we've mentioned in terms of their fragility, in terms of leaning into discomfort as a source of learning and growth. Uh, many ways in which conservation organizations operate are imbued in certain hallmarks that have their origins and ideologies of white supremacy. These hallmarks include perfectionism, a sense of urgency, the right to comfort, um, which is connected to the fear of conflict and defensiveness, quantity over quality, attachment to the written word, either or thinking, fraternalism, and in individualism. And when you look at, we need to look at the ways in which that may have constricted or narrowed uh, an, uh, an approach to conservation. So identifying these characteristics and working to address them is one step in shifting organizational culture. Um, and we will have a link to resources um, because we do want to give credit to a lot of the activists, scholars, um, and community leaders that have been doing this work for a long time. So for example, showing up for racial justice. And then in closing, the very last thing is, well, that we hope that you were able to more deeply understand. So this is an awareness component, the roots of oppression, conservation, and how they're all connected. And most importantly, hope that you'll continue to learn alongside with us. We increase our awareness and move into action. We are not going to solve this in a day or even in our generation, but we do have an opportunity and responsibility to give our less. And when we talk about justice-oriented work is an alignment and then a direction, not a checklist uh, of completion. And then finally, to provide you all with some guidance moving forward, we want to give you all these reflection questions to serve as guidance in moving through difficult, challenging um, uh, the topics of conversations that we acknowledge the process. So reflection questions real quick, and there's four here. What type of conservation do you support and why? What are your values behind that conservation work? What are the assumptions you make about the relationship of humans to the spaces you conserve? Who benefits from your work? Who is left out? And who is driving the decisions? Those are those questions of shared decision making and, of course, uh, roles in space of power. So with that, we're going to pause to see if we might be able to address a question or two. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. You're muted, Mike. Oops. Um, thank you all. Um, I could hear the the work that was going into sharing all that <laughs> from some of you. It's it's intense, and I I appreciate so much the um, the work that you do in recounting these histories, you know, over and over to to folks, so that um, we could have justice and. Um, it's difficult. I, I know a lot of folks are engaging in, in chat um, and, and saying thank you, making comments. Um, so again, thank you. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. So um, quickly, y'all, if you have a question, you might want to type it in quick. Um, there are a couple of things that I thought would be easy to address and, and positive, um, Esme um, in chat was asking, and I think you guys might have some answers to this. Um, do you have any suggestions of places that people can go to hear more stories of um, black, indigenous, and other people of color um, and land connections, um, you know, hear heroes from of conservation, you know, um, any suggestions there to seek out those frameworks informed by um, BIPOC communities and histories? I, I'll really quickly say, I don't think there's one resource because the BIPOC community is not a yeah. monolith. 
right? We're, we're all so diverse. Um, I know the Black Land Project is one place that um, has some resources, but um, on our resources page at theavranagroup.com, we have a whole bunch of books listed there that we've learned from. You know, one about like Chinese loggers in the West. I'm reading one now about um, about uh, post Civil War hunting and fishing among Black communities in the South. Um, so really seeking out those books. But every time we learn something, we do share it on our resources page. So that's one place you can go. Um, and then following people on social media who are continuing to share these stories is another place. There's so many people on social media who are sharing not only his history, but current stories of BIPOC connections to land. Um, mm -hmm. Avon, I don't know if you want to add to that. That's great. Oh. I'll just say that like, I do think that there, yeah, there's no like one repository mm -hmm. of all of this information. We try and keep up on our resources and we just miss things all the time. And I wanna just note that like part of doing the work is finding those resources and sharing them with folks because there isn't this one place where we can go. So yeah, part of the work is doing the digging as well uh, and really encourage you all to, to do that. Um, get curious, go down a Google rabbit hole. The last page of our, our slide deck, which we'll share with you all, actually has a bunch of resources that you could start with. Great, thank you. Um, and I wanted to quickly address, there was a couple of questions, you know, about what, what POST is doing about all this um, information and, and context, you know. Um, uh, we're doing a lot. We're struggling internally and thinking about what internal actions and external actions we're going to take. Um, we're gonna share a resource, which is, um, a web page with some of our commitments and how we're approaching this work going forward. Um, and it's too much to get into because there's so many different categories of response as you understand these different issues and how they show up. Um, so we're gonna be you know, doing our best um, for the rest of our history to, to you know, integrate and course correct as many other organizations are doing. Um, one thing in regards to histories and presenting stories, you know, that we're trying to do with these online events is telling different stories um, from our area. Um, I'm really excited about another event we have coming up, which is about um, Maria Zacarias Bernal de Berriessa, the um, the last uh, California uh, owner of Rancho San Vicente, which is part of Calero County Park now. Um, that's an example of the storytelling that we have to do. Um, yeah, so we're we're close to time now. I think we're gonna have to just leave it at that. Um, oh, Mark, can I answer one question? Yeah, that I'm like dying to answer that folks yeah. asked. Two two folks asked. Someone was asking, how did the indigenous genocide cause the Little Ice Age? Um, my understanding is that because there were so few people that were tending to the land. Um, that it changed the ecology of the land itself. Um, and that led to a little ice age. So I just wanted to put that out there. And um, I'm hoping that that article is in the resources page. It is. Uh, we, we dropped it in the chat for them as well. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Ava. We, we did get a few, um, you know, comments in chat when that came up. And that was something I had never heard. And it totally makes sense. So, well, you know, um, thank you all for the time, we really appreciate this and everybody in the audience is expressing similar, you know, appreciation. So with that, I wanted to mention, um, if any of y'all would like to learn more about the Avarna Group, you could go to their website, theavarnagroup.com, um, doing so much incredible work. Um, and like I mentioned, we have a bunch of other events coming up um, that you all should check out. I'd also like to mention that um, we will be highlighting a couple of our regional partners, including Pi Ranch and Vida Verde that are uh, working on various environmental justice issues, sometimes on post-protected lands. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you for your time today. I hope you have a good rest of your day and nice weekend wherever you are spread out there. Um, so thank you guys. Thank you all, and we'll see you soon. Hasta All right. luego.